All right, I am interrupting your regularly scheduled doom and gloom worrying to do a Bible study and talk about something that will still be very important to think about a year from now, five years from now, 30 years from now, 500 years from now, if the Lord tarries. And we're going to be here in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 38 through 44. This is where Jesus warns us. I mean, it's crazy when I study this passage and I compare it to what I see happening in the church today. And I think this is exactly what Jesus warned us about. He warned us about fake spirituality in our leadership and about money grubbing preachers. Like he's just really stopped and just said, hey, disciples, watch out for this. And we... Um, we haven't heard <laughs> and we have not paid very good attention to it. So we're going to dig through this passage today. We're going to understand it. This is the Mark series, part 51. That's right. Verse by verse, going methodically, carefully, looking for these beautiful, amazing truths in the gospel of Mark, um, giving you a deep Bible study, going through the gospel of Mark verse by verse. If you're interested in checking out the whole series, I have a playlist down below with the entire 51 part series so far and we still have a lot more to cover and i'm excited to dig into it today so let's just get going here we are mark chapter 12 verse 38 we're going to read the whole section it's from here through verse 44 and start just listen don't go for application yet just listen just, i mean not to me so to speak but listen to what jesus is saying here look at the scene as it plays out and think what is happening here Right? Don't jump right to app. People don't, they skip interpretation, they skip observation, they go straight to application. And that is um, why they then go, I'm not really sure how to understand the Bible because they never asked what it meant or what it said or why it was like that. They just said, how do I apply it today? And that's the last step, not the first step. Anyway, here we go. Mark 12, 38. In his teaching, he was saying, beware of the scribes. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake, for appearance's sake, offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Then there's an illustration. These two things go together. We should probably, you know, I think it's good to teach them together what happens next. And he sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. They're putting in large amounts of money. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. And wow, um, after having spent a lot of time studying this passage, I'm just blown away by uh, the fullness of its teaching, the way it protects us from money-grubbing preachers. But on the other hand, it will also protect us from becoming money-grubbing Christians, where we're, we're those who are not giving, not sacrificially wanting to give. And so there's this balance, this sweet spot where we enter into loving, a loving place of giving to the Lord out of the, out of the love of our hearts for the Lord. And we, yet at the same time, we don't heap up to ourselves these shallow, skin deep, um, preachers <laughs> who, who, yes, it, it, it's, it's going on, man. It, there's like a pandemic of fake spiritual leadership um, going on in the church. And it doesn't mean every church, not every church is like that. It's just too many. That's the problem. It's too many. And it's crazy how the most prominent uh, churches, the ones that get the biggest reach are often the ones that the rest of us look at and go, what is going on there? <laughs> what is, what is happening there? Sometimes there's good solid churches that get real real prominent online, so to speak, but um, oftentimes you're just scratching your head if you're like me. All right, so here we are. Let's go through this again, slowly, thoughtfully, verse by verse, understand it carefully. And uh, if, you, if it's your first time here, I'm uh, Pastor Mike Winger, and I do verse by verse teaching, ap apologetics, that's defending the truth of the Christian faith, like showing you how you can know with evidence that this is actually true. And I also do different kinds of theology things, encountering uh, not so much current events in the world as I deal with like politics kind of stuff is why I deal with current theological issues that are going on in cults and in Christianity. And as that touches other religions, that sort of thing is, is sort of my obsession. So here we are, Mark 12, 38. Let's plod through nice and slow. In his teaching, he was saying, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets 
So first thing I want you to notice is that this is a warning. This is a warning. And I think that when Jesus gives a warning to the disciples and then the, the Holy Spirit inspires the authors of the Gospels to make sure to record that warning for every Christian for all time, I think the reason is because this is going to be a pervasive issue that we're all going to face throughout all of our generations. So this beware is because it's going to constantly be a problem. We need to remember that we're not so spiritual we can't fall for this stuff. We do have a tendency, and I say we, I mean me. Okay, and and if, and I figure if I'm like that, then there's probably a group of other people like that too, because we're all just people. We so I'm going to say this: we have a tendency to sort of assume that our church is the safe church, that wherever we've been raised and whatever happens to be going on in the church around us is the right way to do things, is the safe way to do things, and and you know surely this warning is about other people and not me. And and when you say it out loud, it sounds ridiculous. You know how silly it is. But when you don't say it out loud and it just sits in the back of your head, this sort of self-assurance and confidence that whatever this warning's about, it definitely is going to apply to other churches, other people. That is perhaps an area of pride where we should take heed, you know, if we even if we stand, take heed lest we fall. Recognize that this could be happening to you and me right now. I could be falling into these things. And, oh, but my pastors don't have long robes and, and you know, sit in the chief seats of the synagogues. They're like, well... Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the real reasons for why this is a problem. And I think it's a pervasive issue going on, especially in the um, some of the online larger churches that we see. Um, who's, it's funny how those who seem to have the most compromise are also often the most com, you know ambitious about spreading their churches and growing their numbers. And we do need more godly, godly ambition amongst leaders that are preaching the gospel and are holding fast to the true word of God to like push that media ministry and grow that online reach. That's a good thing if you have the substance. It's just weird how it's imbalanced in that uh, those who don't have the substance often are pushing more and more for the reach. Kind of weird. So the beware, that's there. Now, I want to give a warning though. Um, in my younger years, as I was reading these passages, when Jesus talked about Pharisees or scribes, I tended to over-exaggerate what Jesus was saying. And I tended to think it applied to like just generally like religious people or even every Pharisee or every scribe. And that's not what he's saying here. I don't want to go beyond what Jesus says. He doesn't warn them of every single scribe. He says, beware of scribes who... And then he gives a description. So it's not like if you're a scribe, you're lousy, right? It, it's rather there are many scribes who they like these these outward appearance things. They like the the clout of their position. They like the exaltation that they get and they like money and uh, they take advantage of other people. So we don't need to worry about every single scribe. And the way I would apply this now, you, as you understand that, right? Now we'll go to application. I would suggest that some of you guys out there you have seen the Pharisees, the bad kinds in your churches. Um, you've experienced some hardship and some pain and some suffering from those who failed you in leadership, the Christians around you who you feel have mistreated you. And it has perhaps led you to a place where you wouldn't say, beware scribes who? You would just say, beware scribes, right? Or <laughs> not just beware pastors who, right, are shallow and fakely spiritual and money grubbing. You would just be like, beware pastors in general. Like just, you can't trust anybody at all in the body of Christ anymore. All the leaderships are, are, are all the leaders are faulty. All the congregations are, you know, backslidden and, and false. If that's your perspective, I just want to encourage you to go read about Elijah when he thought he was the only guy left that was honoring and serving God. And God was like, you know, you're, you're wrong. <laughs> like I've, I have 10,000 who have not, who've not bowed the knee. God has faithful people. They often don't hit the news. When a pastor lives a faithful life and then dies and goes to be with the Lord, it's not like it's in the New York Times. Faithful pastor leaves legacy of, of honoring Christ in his life and character. Like nobody reports that in the news. But if he has an affair, then it gets in the news, right? If he fails. So that stuff gets exaggerated. It's not everybody. It's just some guys and some ladies who misrepresent Christ. Uh, there are many, many godly people. They just don't get the press. So... Jesus goes on and describes them. Let's look at the details of what's wrong with these people and how I can apply that into our time as well. They like to walk around in long robes. Long robes. Uh, now, this is not the only time Jesus criticizes their apparel. Oops, where am, where am I? Make sure that I'm giving you the same verse. Here we go. Um, oh, no. There we go. 
I, I know what I'm doing. I promise. I, I've, I've done this before. Um, I should be looking at verse... 38. <laughs> there it is. Wait, what? How am I so confused about this? Chief seat synagogues. They like to. Oh, 30. Oh, there it is. 38. Boy, that was weird. All right. They like to walk around in long robes. I have my notes and my Bible software up, and I just got the two mixed up. And uh, this time is not the only time Jesus criticizes their clothing. He actually gets into more detail in Matthew 23 5. So here we are, where Jesus says, but they do all their de all their deeds to be noticed by men. Remember, they're focused on appearance. That's the common thread. Uh, one of the common threads about the criticisms Jesus has about fake leaders is they they do whatever they're doing to be noticed by men. They want people to see them. It's a show. They're putting on a show. And this is what happens in some mega churches, like to just call a spade a spade, right? Where we see this and we're like, that is so showy. I wonder if the substance is there. Right. I, I, and I'm not sure. I don't know the people's hearts. Right. But I, you wonder, you just wonder, like, I hope the substance is there. I hope it's there. And I know there are some, there's like a very large churches, even in our area in California, where I, I do know the substance is there. I know that the pastors behind the scenes are godly people who love the Lord. Okay. There's other places where there isn't the substance. It's just show. And it's hard for us to know. But we can, if we know the people well, if we don't just see them on stage, but we see them in life. Here, he just says, the problem is they do everything to be noticed by men. And then he mentions they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. Let me show you guys what this is to help you understand. Here's a Jewish phylactery. Um, it's basically a box that would be used to hold scripture, like they'd write scripture, real, real small print on a scroll, roll it up, put it in, in the box, and then using leather straps, uh, wrap the box around their arm or wrap it around their forehead. Now, at a, at a younger age, I thought Jesus was just saying that the whole idea of phylacteries was wrong. And the more I've thought about it, the more I think that I was probably incorrect. I was partly responding to the fact that just in my culture, we don't do that. So it was like a weird, oh, the phylacteries, it's like a weird thing other people do or something. Um, but I don't think he was just rebuking them for that. He, and then he also, and I'll talk about what he was rebuking them for in a second. The other thing he mentions is the tassels. Um, so the scribes would wear these these prayer shawls effectively. Their long robes were like a prayer shawl that they would wear. This And this is going to be similar to what you're looking at on the screen here. And the tassels are the fringes, as you see on his arm, these um, tassels coming off. So they would either elongate the, the corners, one translation would say. Um, here it says the tassels. They probably made these tassels much longer. Now the scribes would... would they would not be in a crowd of people in the marketplace walking around where everybody's wearing the same thing. They don't look like the scribes. The scribes are unique here. They're walking around looking this way. Not everybody did. In other words, they're standing out. They're separating themselves from the people. And then to compete with other scribes, they're going to make their tassels even longer. Right? They're going to make their phylacteries even bigger. Like, oh, mine's going to be even bigger on my forehead. And then I'm going to have even more stuff in it. What is Jesus rebuking here? He's not rebuking the phylacteries or the tassels. He's rebuking the enlargement of the phylacteries and the tassels. This is why he says he's upset that they broaden their phylacteries and they lengthen the tassels of their garments. So, I, so you know, when I was younger, I thought this was a rebuke about phyla phylacteries and tassels. I, I don't think it is. I think it's a rebuke about broadening and lengthening them. So let's talk about this for a little bit. Um, there's... There's a real danger that comes from when we, now maybe a phylactery isn't inherently bad, but there's a danger that comes with it and a, and a tassels aren't inherently, but there's dangers that can come alongside of it. And a, a, an example would be like uh, Christians with Bibles. Um, uh, I, I can't reach my, my, my big giant Bible. I have a big giant Bible like from where I'm sitting right now. But, but you know, there's a sense in which you're like, I have a really big Bible and there's... And you know, you would never say, I'm more spiritual because my Bible's really big. Like, nobody would say that out loud. At least, I hope not. But sometimes people do think it a little bit, right? They're like walking, they're carrying around this big Bible. Maybe they're thinking like, it's heavier, it's harder to carry around. So like, I'm like working harder for the Lord, maybe, or something. And it can just turn weird. And it turns into these, where we, we lose the focus on the heart and we're focused on the out, our outward expressions. And that, that attitude can infect leadership, it can infect a whole church, and it can turn us into, into Pharisees where we're whitewashed walls, right? We have the outward appearance, but the inside is dead. And because we look at our own outward appearance and think that is spirituality, we never look deeper and see it the way God sees it. 
this is like a, a legitimate and very real danger. This is this is the thing people in if you guys aren't from the US, this is the thing people are always worried about in the Bible Belt. And I've talked to ministers in the Bible Belt and they're always worried about like the people there, they just assume they're 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 serving Christ, they're following the Lord because they were like they have these outward symbols of Christianity in their lives. But when these God-loving, Christ-loving ministers look at these these people and they go, but are they really living for Christ? Do they really love Christ? Or do they just have the tassels and the phylacteries and the outside things, right? Like the outside proclamations, but not the inside transformations. And um, that's the real issue. And it, it can be super hard. Once people start thinking that the skin is the substance, it can be very difficult to open their eyes to the reality that that's not the case. So Jesus says, beware. He says, watch out. So, so yeah, they like to do these things. Now, um, there's actually kind of a biblical, I say kind of, catch me here. I'm trying to be careful with my words. Kind of a biblical justification for the wearing of these phylacteries. So let's look at this. It's in Exodus. And this is what a, a Jew today, if you're Jewish and you're listening, this, this would be a, a passage you would go to to explain why you're doing this, I think. Exodus 13, 9 says, um, and it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth for a powerful hand the Lord brought you with a powerful hand. The Lord brought you out of Egypt. So it's the law of God that's going to serve as a sign on your hand, as a reminder on your forehead. So these these sign and reminder on the forehead, this is later what that would appeal to to say this is why we use the phylactery or the Hebrew term is tephilin. This is why we're using this because... It says here in, in Exodus. Now, being just a Bible teacher, I would say, well, I don't think that that was literal. Why don't I think it's literal? Because it also says that the law of the Lord would be in your mouth. Okay, so when it's on your hand and your forehead and in your mouth, why would you take these two literally and then this one symbolically? So you you can say I'm, I'm reminding myself with the phylactery. I'm reminding myself of Exodus 13.9 and I would not complain at all. Nor would I say you can't do it. But I don't think Exodus 13.9 is actually commanding that, right? Like it's, that's why I said sort of. <laughs> it's, the, the symbols is, is there, but the reality I don't think is. Again, in Exodus 13.16, we see this. So it shall serve the law of God. It shall serve as a sign on your hand and as phylacteries on your forehead. And there's that, there's that term, a front litter band. That's a term. It's not, it's not like a unique term only used to describe this one thing that, that uh, you know, the, some, some Jews today still do. It's a term just describing something like that on your head. Um, for with a powerful hand, the Lord brought us up out of Egypt. And so again, there it is. But I, I also think this is meant to be um, symbolic. The word of God's on your mind. The word of God's in your in your life. You're living out the commands of God. You're thinking about them and they're in your mouth. So you're speaking about them. I think that's the, the, uh, the statement that's being made there. And then Deuteronomy 6, 8 will be the other one for the phylacteries. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets, frontals or frontlets, depending on your translation there, on your forehead. And uh, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, this one is is more of a challenge because like you're actually going to, this sounds more literal, doesn't it? You're going to write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That sounds more literal. Verse 8 here says you'll bind them as a sign on your hand. They'll be as frontlets on your forehead. Um, the I, I, I honestly could see someone going, I just feel like I'm honoring Deuteronomy 6, 6 8 here. <laughs> and, and then I would I would just lay off. I'd be like, hey, I'm not going to argue with you there. Now, we're not under the law. This is definitely part of the Mosaic law, that command to Israel. And so it doesn't. it's more of a scholastic discussion for Christians, I think. Um, but here's the thing. The, the, the scribes that Jesus is warning us about, these are the ones who, they don't just have phylacteries, they have bigger phylacteries. They don't just have robes, they have longer robes, robes with longer tassels or prayer shawls with longer tassels. They don't just want seats in the synagogue, they want the best seats in the synagogue, according to Jesus. What, what is Jesus opposed to? He's opposed to the self-exaltation and the shallow spirituality that's represented in leaders. And, and I can just, it's like I can see it in 3D. Can you just imagine the impact it has when the accepted spiritual leaders are shallow and vain in their spirituality? How does that affect everyone else? Because guess what? People look to their leaders as the pinnacle of what they one day might achieve. And if your pinnacle example is shallow spirituality, it starts to just gut the love of God from the whole group of people. And it turns into this like passive aggressive spiritual competition between different individuals. 
And that happens in churches. It doesn't mean it's happening in every church. But it absolutely can happen in churches. And this is this is my fear. This is where I see the application is so incredibly relevant for us today. And I want to understand it well enough that I could see if it's in my own heart, if fake spirituality is in my own heart that's there. Um, and I've seen it in, oh, I've seen, I've seen people who have fake spirituality because of their, forgive me, it did appear that they did, right? Like this was a fear of mine. I, I could be wrong. Maybe I misread them where um, prayers were elongated in an artificial and strange fashion that makes you wonder like, is this real or are you just praying to like look spiritual? I've also seen people who had the shortest prayers in the world because in their view, the shortest prayers were the more powerful, right? Were the more excuse me, more spiritual. And when we're taking pride in our prayers of any kind, right? Whether it's, I use King James, well, I use natural language and that's the more spiritual. When we're doing this, it's just, we're all wrong. We're all wrong. <laughs> this is not the substance. This is the this is the skin. It's not the thing. So Jesus isn't opposed to these things entirely, um, but he's opposed to us exalting ourselves. And the solution, I want to say the solution, uh, being a pastor who's never worn a robe, the solution is not that your pastors can never wear robes. Like that may help. It might, right? But I, I know there's there's pastors who you're part of a group, you're part of a denomination. It's just it's just tradition. You guys, you wear these robes. Everybody's used to it. It's been happening forever. You haven't really thought about it much. I don't think that that means you're, you're fitting this bill of being a scribe. My question to you would be, do you love it? Do you love wearing that robe? Is it like, man, I got my robe. Look at me. Ooh, wow. Look at, look at who I am now. Look at who I've become because I've put on this outfit. Now I'm getting worried about you. <laughs> no, I'm worried. So the don't wear a robe thing, it might help to not wear it because then it doesn't, it doesn't present itself as a temptation. But it's not itself the problem. It's the, uh, it's the love of it. That's the problem. And, and I think that's, that we can sometimes think, well, but Mike, we're, I'm, I'm Calvary Chapel, right? So we're Calvary Chapel. We're like immune to all that sort of thing. Hey man, we're like immune to that stuff, right? Because because we have no traditions because we're Calvary chapels, and um, but that's not true. <laughs> that's not really true. In fact, I would suggest that sometimes mega churches, the ones that I've mentioned before, and I'm being super frank with you guys here, some of the mega churches we see, and some, not all, some of the mega churches we see online, that they're they they have the most beautiful skin in the world. Their church, and I don't mean the people's attractiveness. I mean from the lighting and the stage and the setup and everything is just methodically planned out from the sweeping camera movements and all this stuff, which aren't in and of themselves bad. But those can lead to where you start to think that equals God is working here. This is the move of the spirit. Look, we have large numbers. Look, we have a big building. Look, we have the bells and whistles. Bells and whistles simply are spirituality. Um, and that happens all the time. I remember we, we did a trip to Israel one year and we um, we had somebody with us who is of, of a of a denomination that's more liturgical. And we had traveled, we went to Galilee, we had gone to Jerusalem, we had been to the Dead Sea, we'd been to all these different places. And when we, when we got to one particular church, we went inside and they had incense burning, which I don't have a problem with incense. They had big stained glass windows and I don't have a problem with those either. What I had a problem with is that when we walked in, this one lady in our group said, now I feel like we're really in a spiritual place. And I just thought, like, you could, like, an atheist can burn incense and make stained glass windows, right? Like, this is not the substance. This is the skin. Like, I, and, and so I'm one of those who felt like it was cooler when I was just standing at the Sea of Galilee with no buildings around. You know, that was, to me, more neat. Um, and to her, it was more neat to be the other one. But I'll tell you what the same thing. The Sea of Galilee itself is just a location. It's I have the presence of God in me. Like I should be more in awe every morning when I wake up and realize I've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Like that should blow me away more than any of those other things. Golly, when you go visit the Temple Mountain, you're all excited about it. It's like you, you are the temple. <laughs> you should get excited about that even more. So the priests, um, they had special, in, in, back in the first century, give you some historical context here, right? The priests... Um, they had special garments back then. And so we can't we can't say that Jesus is outlawing all special garments for like spiritual leaders here. And he doesn't do that here. He just, he criticizes them for trying to outdo each other in these things and making it competitive and then, you know, skin deep spirituality. That's what he's criticizing. But we know that in the Old Testament, priests had different clothing that God commanded them to wear. So you can't say that like, you know, leaders having different clothes is inherently bad. On the other hand, I will say this. 
there's a big difference between priests in the Old Testament compared to the rest of the Jews versus leaders, Christian leaders, compared to the rest of Christians. See, priests were legitimately like closer to God in the Old Testament because the dwelling place of God was the temple and the priests were to represent the separation, like the middle ground between the separation of, of God and the people. And the priests had to come offering sacrifices and they had to be clean and they had to be all, take all these rituals. They all ultimately picture Christ and they represent Jesus in these amazing and beautiful ways. But that clothing was part of helping us see the separation, right? The, the uncleanness of normal people trying to enter the presence of God that was cured by Jesus Christ. So when we get to New Testament, when we get to New Covenant times, then we see all of the people are priests. Like, you're a priest. I'm a priest. I'm just a Christian who has a different gift set than you. I'm not a better Christian than you. And the, the pastor is not the godliest man in the church by virtue of teaching in the pulpit every, every Sunday. Yet sometimes we feel like that's the case and that's weird. So... We just have different gift sets, but we're all priests. We're all indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So in that principle, I'm going to say that I'm not trying to overturn what churches are doing if they have these old traditions that they're holding on to, and I'm not even trying to criticize that. But I do want to make an observation is that the difference between priests and non-priests in, in Jewish times is not parallel to the difference between leaders and non-leaders in the Christian church or pastors and non-pastors. That's not parallel. We're all priests. And I don't want to create a situation where people feel that they are less because they're not a pastoral leader. I think that's a scary and unfortunate situation. Um, I'm not, I mean, I'm not more spiritual than you by virtue of the fact that I'm teaching the word of God and doing these things. In fact, I would, I would argue that my spirituality is going to be independent of that stuff. My, the, my genuine spirituality is going to be all the stuff I do when I'm not teaching. That's going to be the representative of my true spirituality. And, and you would only guess at that. Um, but I'm like super spiritual. Trust me. Just trust me. I'm like so spiritual. It's crazy. Um, so was uh, what what's next here? Um, yeah, sometimes I would say um, mega churches can actually be the worst. I started on talking about this and I got off on the rabbit trail. But mega churches might think we don't have traditions. Uh, maybe Calvary Chapels like myself would think we don't have traditions. But yet our tra we do. We just don't think they're traditions because they're different than other traditions traditions um not that not that we exalt them as as if they're the word of god that's the problem with tradition is exalting it too high it's not that you have it at all um, tradition is not inherently wrong it's just recognize what it is it's it's man-made but you know if, if you think um you know stained glass windows make us more holy well then you have a problem or but if you also think like we meet in a warehouse therefore we're more holy or we're just meeting in a home church and home churches are automatically more holy than those big just big churches down the street that we look sideways at Okay, you have a problem, right? These are, this is just the skin. If you think like my pastor teaches out of a giant, you know, his pulpit is a giant wine barrel and that's what he teaches off of and that makes it like it's more authentic. You're like, no, it's just a wine barrel. Like <laughs> how does that equal authentic? Sometimes pastors who have no ties to old traditions are the most carefully groomed and traditions like, you know, sometimes spend way too much money on their clothes and, and really carefully grooming themselves. What I'm suggesting is that all of this is just outward stuff and it's effectively meaningless when it comes to our actual walk with God or our actual spirituality. And it's when we attach meaning to it that we fall into a lot of problems and we turn into these shallow, com spiritually competitive environments that are very unhealthy. We're to be clothed, clothed with love and good works. Um, let, let's talk about what these guys enjoy for a minute. The scribes, what they enjoy, what these particular scribes enjoy is... Um, let's, well, let me highlight so you can see how much Jesus is focused on this. Um, here in, um, twelve thirty-eight, he says that they like, right? They enjoy, they take pleasure walking around in long robes. Okay. So when, when the scribes wore these long and elongated tassels on these, on these shawls, these robes that they had. It was normal custom in the first century that if they were walking through the marketplace, you were supposed to rise as they walked past. Now, how did you know to rise? Well, you didn't memorize every scribe's face, right? You knew because of their robes, right? This was the identifier, this 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 long robe. And um, they liked it. They liked it. They enjoyed it. They also liked respectful greetings. They liked when people would say to them like, oh, oh, scribe or rabbi, oh, leader, teacher. They, they liked that. They also like 
chief seats in the synagogues. The, the, these seats would actually face towards the audience, the chief seats in the synagogues. Uh, some of them would face towards the audience. And this is so that you could sit and you're looking at people and you're... <laughs> I just laugh because I just visualize it. And you're like looking out at the people and you're watching towards them, you know. And um, let's just say this leads to problems, this kind of this kind of um, exalting of special individuals in the church. And they they like places of honor at banquets. So these are the things that they enjoy. And here's how we can now apply this into our lives. Leaders, if you're a leader, you're a worship leader, you're a counselor in the church, you're a, you're a pastor. Do you like it when people call you leader? Do you enjoy being called pastor? Do you like it when somebody comes up to you that maybe you don't really know that well, but they're like, pastor, pastor, is that, does it feel good? Like, be really honest with yourself. Does it feel good? Can I say that's a symptom of a problem? You don't have to feel bad, but you shouldn't be feeling good. That's kind of a, a symptom of a problem. This is this is the issue they have. They like it. They like it when they walk into the room and they're greeted and people get up and they notice them and they're like, oh, oh, give honor to whom honor is due, right? A verse that seems to have no limit in some places. And they enjoy it. Here's a, here's a red flag that, that will make a lot of sense to some people. Some of us start serving in church and we're just doing ministry. It's very organic, right? Like we're, we're just start helping out here and there. And because you're helping out and because you seem knowledgeable about the word of God, sometimes people will call you pastor and you're not a pastor. You're just helping, right? You're just there to help and you just, they call you pastor. And I think this is a great way to test where your heart is. Um, so my opinion here, but I've seen this happen in real life. If, if people call you pastor and you're not one, do you let them? Like, do you, do you just let them? You're like, I'm not technically a pastor, but that's all right. You want to call me that? That's all right. No, I'm not going to complain. I won't say anything. You know, I don't want to embarrass you by correcting you. So I'll let you continue calling me a pastor. And I remember walking into a ministry one time where a guy was helping and serving a wonderful man. I love the Lord. I'm not trying to criticize him for for this, but I walked in and everybody was calling him pastor and he wasn't a pastor. And I just, I just was asked him, I said, do you think it means anything to be a pastor? <laughs> <laughs> because you want to, you'll you'll accept the title when it's not there. So, do you think it means anything? And um, and I think it's just a matter of at least a, t a part of it is this little temptation to just enjoy the titles, enjoy the enjoy all that kind of stuff, which which should scare guys like me because I have way too much attention on me just from the sake of doing the online ministry, and it's going to create all kinds of temptation and all kinds of opportunities for me to be the one who's like, oh, I like it when people mention me, oh, when they talk about me. Like this is going to be a very real, just super honest, very real issue here. I I promise you, um, my reputation and I'm, from seeing this is is bigger than it should be on, even online. I'm trying to be faithful and serve and teach and all that, but I'm just your brother. Like in reality. And then someone's going to be like, oh, oh, he's so humble. And they're like, no, no, that's not even humility, guys. <laughs> like, that's just, this is just a reality check. Like I'm just your brother in Christ who's trying to work hard to bring a particular benefit to the body of Christ and the Lord's blessing that and that's all on him. But um, but yeah, you got to watch out, man. How much do you like it? Do you like the chief seats, the places of honor at banquets? Do you like it? Do you enjoy it? That is that is a questionable thing. Um, another way to test this would be would be this: if you're a leader in the church, is how do you act when people treat you poorly, when people don't give you the respect that you think you deserve in your role? How do you respond? Uh, that is a huge indicator of of hu where your humility or pride is at at the moment. Um, how do you respond? And if you respond, there's various ways to respond in pride. But basically, if you respond in humility, right, where you're just like, you know. I'm not so special that I need to obsess about the way I'm treated. Um, then that's a really healthy thing. There's just an inherent conflict, it seems, between my service to the Lord and my reputation. And the more I serve the Lord and the more impact I have, the more my reputation is going to rise and the more it's going to threaten that authentic service. And so you might start genuine humility serving well. And then over time, you start to shift over to your reputation. You're thinking about your 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 posturing and what people think of you. And that should scare you. It should scare me. It should scare me more than you actually, right? Because this is, the, unless you have a large reaching ministry, it's going to be an even bigger deal for someone like me. I should be very aware of this warning. Watch out, Mike. Don't just watch out for these scribes that they won't affect you. Watch out that you won't become one. You like the greetings. You like the attention. I should be scared of that stuff, to be honest. 
I think this stuff then, if, if the leadership gets it, if it infects the leadership, that it has a tendency, in my opinion, to trickle down into the whole church so that you, you as, a, as someone who's attending the church, say you're serving in the church, it's not enough to be like a real godly, faithful person who has some gifting, some equipping from the Lord to do ministry. You also have to have like a good veneer, right? Have you had that feeling, right? Where you, we can, you, I'll give you an example from a workplace. Maybe you're like the best worker, but you don't like kiss up as much. And so the other guy gets the promotion and you don't. And you're like, I'm the one actually doing the work. I just don't kiss up as much as the other person over there. That's the veneer. And in the church thing, it can be like, I'm, I'm, I'm laboring, I'm serving well, but I'm just not doing anything inauthentic. And sometimes people who do things that are inauthentic can portray a much greater spirituality than they actually possess. And those who don't notice it will reward it. And then they will put in, they'll install fake spiritual leaders. And those leaders have the same blind spots. So they install more. So then you have like, sadly, and I don't want to equip people to criticize your own fellowships. I just think it's a real issue in the body. So please have grace. Even if you're in a church where this is happening, try to have grace towards them. But what can happen potentially is the godliest people who are the best servants and are the best equipped are not in the leadership. It's the people who have the best veneer. Now, if you're that person who's not in leadership, I would just say, honor the Lord where you're at. Like, why do you need to be in leadership? If you're really that godly, you can just honor God wherever you're at. You don't need to be exalted in that sense. So you shouldn't, it shouldn't be a problem to, in all reality for you personally. But it is a problem for the church because we have leadership that has these kinds of issues. And that's a sad, a sad thing. We need people with substance and leaders must not reward veneers. And this is why, as if you're a pastor who's looking at hiring other leaders and you're looking at raising people up, you're a board that's deciding on who's going to be the next pastor. And you have this guy who seems really, really godly. He's grounded in the word. And you have another guy who seems a little bit sketchy, but man, he's really good on stage. Go for that guy, right? Go for the first guy, not the second guy. Being good on stage is not a requirement for leadership in the New Testament. It's character, right? Over and over, read, read the epistles and follow that. That is God's guide for how we select our leaders. They have character traits of godliness. This is more important than their skills. It's their character. Secondarily, skills matter. And this is this is a Christian value. This is not um, so much a, a, a one that the world's going to share all the time. But we do need people with substance. So we have to care as much about substance as Jesus does, does. We have to be like him when he looks at the widow giving and he looks at the people giving and he sees it for what it really is. We've got to learn to be better at that, especially when we apply it in the mirror to ourselves. And then if we're in leadership deciding who will be raised up, we have to apply it to them as well. So here's a solution for pastors. Um, pastors... Th th you hear that you've heard this before, pastor, if you're listening. And... This isn't going to be new, but I want you to consider it very seriously because this is a very real danger. And I think you know it is. Don't disassociate yourself from all your people so that all they ever see is the veneer. Um, I mean, ideally, you don't have a veneer, right? But if people only know you when you're on stage and they don't know you privately outside of being on stage, if you retreat from the stage and then you leave the church as soon as possible and then you don't have any close friends who would actually call you and keep you accountable for issues like not yes men but like people who actually would keep you accountable people who you would be ashamed when they discovered that you had compromised in some way right not people who would just turn a blind eye but if you just like you teach and then you leave and you become anonymous to the church and the only way in which you know your fellowship is the stage that's a dangerous place to be that's a dangerous place to be have real relationships you, don't, you can't know everybody in your church especially if your church is large right there's no way you can know it but you can at least intimately and genuinely know some of the people who are really there, not just a special circle of, of unnamed pastors from other churches that you say, I'm, I have an accountability group and nobody knows their names <laughs> and they don't go to your church. Why? Because then they'd be able to keep you accountable in a different way. It's like, dude, don't do that. It's just, it's, it's not going to ruin you immediately, but it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Don't, don't protect the stage image. Don't have a stage image. Just be you. Just be you. I knew one one pastor I'd heard, he said that when he got up on stage, it was like he became a different person. And he would preach and he would do all that stuff. And I always thought that was the weirdest thing. I just thought, Lord, if that's what teaching is, I don't think I want to do it. You know, <laughs> if, getting, if I have to get on stage and become a different person, I don't understand that. And I don't think I can do that. And And I've probably been passed over on opportunities to do various teaching things because I don't 
do some of the stuff that in all honesty looks looks a little weird to me but seems to draw crowds and seems to get people asked to come back um at any rate we want genuineness that's what we're all about that's what the church should be all about even if it means we have less stage worthy leaders because we have more leadership worthy leaders and praise god for that all right let's look at the next verse here verse 40 they devour widows houses now i want to focus on this for a moment it jesus just spits it out there doesn't even explain what he means but i think that if you are honest and you look at the pervasive issues throughout the church for ever you will see this is totally it's clear i think what it ultimately is is going to apply to so they devour widows houses for appearance sake they offer long prayers and they'll receive a greater condemnation um how do they devour widows houses well scribes okay we've talked about the different jewish groups in this mark series there's like the pharisees right there's the there's the sanhedrin we talked a lot about them recently they tended to be these rich aristocratic type people independently rich but the scribes were not independently rich the scribes were generally making their living off of the donations that came in to the temple this is why the scribes are the ones that devour widows houses because those as someone who who makes his living off of the donations that come into this ministry let me say this those who live off the donations of others will be presented with opportunities to abuse those people asking for too much money trying to get more finances for themselves if a pastor is ever asking for for as a pastor from ever asking for people to give funds so that i can get more money into my pocket that's when it's time for me to get a job that's a not i mean i already have a job pastoring is a real and difficult job but and it's <laughs> i mean just look at the look at the statistics on it it's, it's a very real and very difficult and stressful job but it may be time for you to get that second job because we're not to be trying to cause people to give for our sakes like that like that's just it just can't work that way. It just can't work that way. Now, there are, I don't know if you guys know this, but in India, I talked to a missionary in India, and he was saying that there's a um, a feel, a vibe, a sense in the leadership in India, in a large part of India, or maybe the whole place, I don't know, that, that pastors have to live off of the donations of the people. They can't work a second job, a secular job, that that's somehow a compromise. And I just want to say, like, Paul the Apostle, in when he went to Corinth, he purposely worked, a, a, you might call it a secular job. I mean, he made tents, right? He, he worked a job that was not directly about teaching and doing pastoral ministry. He made tents. He just worked and cutting and sewing and whatever. He made tents and then sold them. And this was how he helped pay his own way. This was something he did because he knew that for whatever reason, right, for a number of reasons, it was not going to be good for him to even receive donations from Corinth because he, he wanted to build a bridge with them. And so there's, there's times for that and there's wisdom in that. So there is a temptation that we could be like them. We could be like devouring widows' houses. Um, anytime you're living off of others, um, you could easily come to abuse them. And this is something that we have to be very, very careful of. Pastors need to be very aware. I, I think we often don't think about this stuff because, well, let me just put it this way. Look at your church and look at the giving in your church as if you were a non-believer visiting your church for the first time who's never been to church. And if you look at that and you go, oh my, I would immediately conclude that my church is a scam. Then I would say, it doesn't mean your church is a scam, but it does mean that you're doing something a little recklessly at least. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that would be, it's still right for people to give. I'm just saying it's wrong for pastors to push. That's it. It's right for people to give. It's wrong for pastors to push. In fact, that's one of the applications of this passage. You're going to see this. The widow's going to give tremendously yet the um, the leaders are rebuked for devouring widows' houses. So yeah, they, they make their living off of giving. Uh, in Luke 16, 14, uh, the scripture says that these these people loved money. They were lovers of money. The Pharisees actually in particular in this case. Now the Old Testament uh, does weigh in on this uh, about God's love for widows. God constantly speaks about the, protect, the protection of widows and orphans and those who don't have like that that leader protector in their life that God wants wants us all to make special allowances for them to take care of them to, to help them you see a widow in your neighborhood check in on her see if she's doing all right make sure you know she doesn't have family that's, that's already doing that for her that someone's doing that like that's just a biblical and christian and moral thing to do um but this is different than the karmic view like the, in you know say india the karma view is like if you're if you're a, if you're poor you're widow you're in hard times you just did something bad in a, in a past life there are no past lives that the, the biblical view is that the poor are often there because they're oppressed and they're certainly more likely to be oppressed because they have less appeal to those with power to help them. And that's 
that's a biblical truth. And it's also true in scripture that sometimes the poor are poor because they're lazy. Um, Proverbs chapter six talks about the ant. Go to the ant, you sluggard. <laughs> right? And it says like, you're, you're, you, you're going to become poor because you're lazy. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands that it's going to lead you to poverty. Uh, Proverbs 10, four, it says that poor, uh, poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. So, so poverty, this woman is, she's a widow and she's poor. It could be that it was because she was lazy, but probably not. Probably she's poor because she's a widow because the breadwinner is gone. And there she is. She's got two mites. Maybe some family helps take care of her and stuff like that, but she's almost nothing. Uh, biblically speaking, wealth is not a virtue. Um, and I think in the past, our culture would have thought wealth is a virtue. Maybe some people still do. But there's another overreaction to this in our culture where we think poverty is a virtue. That's also not true. Right? Wealth and poverty are not virtues. They're just your situation. And if they're caused, if the wealth is caused by um, wickedness, then it's evil. If it's caused by diligence and hard work and, and godly behavior, then it's good. If poverty is caused by laziness, then it, it's poverty and you deserve it. And it, it's, it's, it's a shameful poverty. If it's caused by hard, hardship and situations you can't control and things like that, then it's just a sad, a sad suffering that's going on. And um, it's complicated. So let me talk for a minute about why I am so excited that Jesus rips on these guys for devouring widows' houses. Because, and I'm going to speak about 20 years ago about TBN, Trinity Broadcasting Network. I remember being a young Christian, finding the only Christian channel on TV, back when uh, when I, I watched TV, and the only Christian channel was TBN that I was aware of. And I remember watching it because I just couldn't find anything good to watch. I, I was living in a home that was basically secular, um, a lot of ungodliness going on, and it felt like finding a Christian channel was exciting to me because it was like, wow, I can have like more Bible and more like worship. And, and I watched it for hours and hours and hours. And I just, I just, I went from being excited to being confused, to trying to figure out what was going on, to slowly hating everything about it. <laughs> and, and the reason is because they devour widows houses now i'm not speaking now i know this over the years many years this is 20 years ago um there are some great programs that ended up on tbn many years later but i'm talking about the and i and not that they're all great because they're not it's a mixed bag as far as i can tell but the 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 time back then it was like all i ever saw being a young guy who was just very eager to dig into this stuff was shysters and scoundrels and people who devour widows houses and i looked at it and sometimes you're like why are there these weird blue-haired old ladies on here and then the things they say are weird and they don't communicate to a young person at all i slowly realized their target audience was old ladies because old ladies have been targeted by religious shysters throughout time and jesus warned us about it here in mark chapter 12. elderly people why because they're sincere. Why? Because they do honestly care about God's future kingdom and they're ready to give up what they have left in this world for what's coming. They're worried about the next generation and the work of God in this world and people take advantage of those passions and then they shyster them out of their life's savings and the inheritance that might have gone to their kids goes to these, um, it goes to Benny Hinn. Uh, it goes to Kenneth Copeland. It goes to these these people who should never get another dollar from anybody. Um, and nor would they need to. They could just live the high life off the millions that they've already stockpiled up off of the houses of widows they've devoured. And I love that Jesus talks about this. And the next thing he says is that they will get greater condemnation. Okay, they're fake spiritual people. They they are money grubbing because they get money from poor and from and from vulnerable people. They encourage them to give way too much and they try to do it to enrich themselves because of their wickedness. And Jesus doesn't end without saying they're going to be condemned even greater. The greater judgment for them. And there is different degrees of judgment depending on our circumstances and our responsibilities and our um, knowledge and all that. Leaders have a stricter judgment. I have a stricter judgment. Um, God help me to not incur it upon me by saying things that are wrong. Yeah, the Lord cares. Um, and you'd think they'd be ashamed. you think Kenneth Copeland would be ashamed. You, you would think these things. But as, as, as I've looked at it, maybe you've looked into the two, you see that they don't, they just double down. When you, when you push against, you know, the Benny Hens and the blue-haired 
not not that blue hair means you're ungodly, but it was just weird. It just showed their target audience was old ladies, I think. Um, it, you you look at it and you realize they. If if I was to say, aren't you guys ashamed? I'd realize they're not. They just boast. Oh, God's gonna gonna bless you as you bless me. He wants us all to be rich, starting with me. <laughs> Give me your money, and that'll make you rich. And and that's how you know. That's how you know. It's interesting that your path to riches is always giving them money. So I think this devour widow houses, this little phrase, these little four little words, it just gives us a shining light into what these people were doing. They had the outward appearance of religiosity with the lights, camera, action going on with all the robes and the tassels and the phylacteries broadened and the greetings in the marketplaces and the appearance of pomp and all that sort of thing. And they were using it to fleece the flock, so to speak. They love money. They boast of their wealth. I think this is a problem that many pastors have not prepared their people for. There's pastors, I know, I know there's pastors that listen to this. I'm, I'm, I'm in awe that I get an opportunity to speak into your guys' lives in some fashion. Um, I know I'm not like your leader you trust beyond, you know, God or wisdom or Jesus or something like that, but I'm just glad I get to have a place. And here's my encouragement to you. If you're a pastor and you're thinking, well, Mike, I'm not like that. And chances are you're not, right? Because you probably aren't watching my stuff if you're that way. Um, you wouldn't be drawn to this kind of content. But my question to you is this, are your people ready to reject a leader if he is like that? So if you died today and the person who stepped into your pulpit was this money-grubbing, shallow, fake spiritual person, would your people be able to reject him? Or have they, so have, have you taught them to be discerning and wise and faithful to Jesus in scripture? Or have you taught them to trust the pulpit? And there's kind of a difference between these things because they can trust the pulpit, in which case, Whoever else gets into that pulpit gets the same degree of trust. Or they can have this sort of like equipping and discernment to be able to even disagree with you if you come back and you've gotten weird. And this is a biblical principle. I'm, I, I love this. I think I've never heard anybody teach it. <laughs> but, but I think it's thoroughly biblical. Is that we should equip our people to, to disagree with us. Pastors. You should train your people to be able to disagree with you and be okay if they do, right? I mean, obviously not, not disagree with the gospel of Christ, but disagree with me, yeah. And that's what Paul gets at, Galatians 1.8. He says, even if we, this is Paul the apostle. Talk about trusting the pulpit. You could trust the apostle, right? He says, even if we or an angel from heaven, talk, an angel from heaven, you could trust an angel from heaven, right? He says, no, no, if we preach to you a gospel contrary to what we've preached to you, he's accursed. So don't believe him. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to me. If I come and I start, look guys, if I get weird and in 10 years, Mike Winger is over here and I've got my bling and I'm talking about the blessings of God and the windfall and how you need to give a seed of faith offering $10,000 seed of faith offering. I got another prosperity verse for you here in the scripture. Let me open up. And if I start doing that, if I'm like, here, let me open up this, my new Bible translation. <laughs> you need to be, you need to have been so grounded in the truth of God that you can catch when representatives of God aren't, that they're not grounded, that they're not really representing the truth. So my encouragement is pastors, don't teach your people to trust the pulpit. That makes that feels good. It makes you feel really good, right? Teach them to, to know the word and have enough discernment to know if you get off base. That, that is valuable, not easy to do. It takes years. So then Jesus goes on, uh, he goes on and he talks about how for appearance sake, they offer long prayers. Um, let me see if I can just back right into it here. All right. Here, Jesus mentions how for appearance sake, they make long prayers. Verse 40. Now, again, I don't want to, um, I don't want to overreact to this. I don't want to suggest that long prayers are therefore not religiously good because then for appearance sake, we're making short prayers. You see, the problem here isn't the length of the prayer. It's the appearance sake part. Long prayers are great. Short prayers are great. King James Version style prayers, great. That doesn't matter. The issue is when you think it matters. That's the issue. That's when, that's when it's a problem is when you think those outward empty things make a difference. Now, for, for those of us who aren't, I've talked to pastors a bit. For those who aren't pastors, I want to I wanna give you a, a moment to apply this into your heart. These guys, one of the criticisms Jesus has is that when they pray in public, they're more worried about the public than they, worry, they are worried about the God who hears their prayers. And they're more worried about what the public thinks of them than they are worried about the public agreeing in prayer to God. This is something 
that is so relevant for every Christian today. You feel like I'm spiritual. And then the second someone's like, would you lead us in prayer? All you're thinking of is the people and what they think of me as I pray out loud in front of a group. And it's totally self-obsessed. This just happens automatically because we're just selfish people and we're self-focused and we're nervous and we're worried about ourselves. And I want to say, stop, stop. If you will not pray in public because you're afraid of what people think of you, that's, it's shameful. If you do pray in public so you can influence what people think of you and make yourself look spiritually good, that's shameful. These are both things that we, we shouldn't even be thinking about this. It shouldn't be occurring to me. What do you think of me as I pray right now? I don't need to care about that. What I should think about as a hopefully a loving and outward person, I should think, I want to pray not so you can approve of me. I want to pray so you can agree with me. Because prayer is about agreement, right? So I do want to speak in a way as I pray publicly, pray publicly so that you understand my words. Because as I pray privately, Lord knows my thoughts too, so I don't have to explain things as much to him. But in public, I explain it a little bit more. I get into more detail perhaps. Perhaps I, I, I'm praying and sharing information while I pray so that, that you can agree with me. That's important. I want to care about what you know and that you agree, but not that you approve of me. You know that feeling you get when you're asked to pray in public the first time and it freaks you out? It's this temptation to be obsessed about yourself and to stop worrying about God who hears your prayers or the actual beautiful spiritual moment that's happening, the people of God agreeing in prayer to God Almighty who hears us because of Christ. Like, like that should be what blows our minds constantly in that moment. But instead, I'm just thinking about my reputation and how... I care about me feeling uncomfortable or me wanting praise or me wanting not to have attention and all that's all self-focus. But can I say this? All those same temptations you have in that moment of prayer, that's what pastors are going to face every time they enter the pulpit. That's what they're going to face whenever they go into counseling, right? Because when they go to counseling, they're not just, perhaps they're not just thinking about helping this person. They're thinking about looking like they have the answers. That's vain spirituality. That's self it's just the shallowness that constantly threatens to invade our spiritual leadership and my leadership as well. That's the constant threat. You know, I, I want to appear like I know what I'm talking about instead of I want to equip the people of God with the truth of God. These are conflicting things. I have to pick one and I have to make it the priority. I want to look like I'm the answer man or I want to actually help this person and not mislead them in any way. These are not going to work together all the time because sometimes looking like you're the answer man means you give answers that aren't even legit, that mislead people, but you walk away feeling like, I checked that off. That was a good pastoral moment. I had my moment of, I heard the question, I gave the perfect answer, and I walked away the man of God. And um, pastors do it all the time. Sorry. I think it happens all the time. I think that we don't realize that this is the same kind of fake spirituality Jesus warns us about. Stage ministry is dangerous. I call I call them stage ministries. Worship leaders. um, um, uh, pastors, basically even people who do announcements, people who are are leading the prayer group, the small prayer groups, any, any ministry that puts you in front of other people is a potentially dangerous, threatening ministry to your spiritual life. It just is because it comes with a host of um, temptations to be the veneer instead of the genuine sincere. It's dangerous. It's dangerous for me. I, I can't look like a godly Christian. I can't look like, oh, Mike, you know, looks like a genuine guy. Like, I just have to be a genuine guy and maybe I'll look that way, maybe I won't to other people. I just have to not think about that because it threatens the genuineness of that ministry. Think about how you are, not how you look. And now here's here's some encouragement too. If you're in a church where they they raise people up, they promote them, they give them different ministry positions because of the veneer and not because of the sincere my little cute little veneer sincere. That's cute, right? Um, if you're in a church that's doing that and you're thinking, I have to put on a veneer or I won't get that promotion or I won't get that thing, I want to encourage you to stop. It's better to labor in obscurity than to get the promotion because of the veneer. It's better to just be the janitor and nobody asks you to do anything that you consider like really amazing. Although I think anything you do for the Lord's amazing. It's better to be that than to get the job through a veneer. Because the problem is when you get a, a ministry position by faking who you are, you are then required to keep faking because that's the requirement of getting the thing, right? Like this, it just becomes this cycle that feeds itself. And some pastors have been trapped in this. They, they experience the anxiety of their ministry on a regular basis because they've put up a veneer 
and it's created massive amount of internal anxiety. And then they go up every week and they continue to try to present the veneer and then they get done and they walk away and they feel like it was all fake, even though they're speaking truth of God, they're ministering to people, people are being transformed and impacted, but it's, they just need to get rid of the veneer. Now, getting rid of the veneer, when I say that, I don't mean that you let everyone know how carnal you really are. You need to actually be a godly person. Like that's a requirement for leadership. I just mean that you stop worrying about the impression people get and you just be genuine, be real and ignore PR. Just ignore it. It's going to cost you and it'll be beautiful because you're going to lose a few things. Those things will be gone. And then you'll look around and be like, oh, I didn't really need that stuff anyway. <laughs> like now I can just be genuine and serve the Lord as I am. Oh, it's a relief. It's a relief. I'm not going to worry about expectations. I'm not going to worry about appearances. I'm just going to worry about genuine ministry, genuinely loving and serving God and being real. Man, it's a relief. It keeps you from getting put in ministry positions you don't belong because there's nothing fake about you. So you won't be put places you don't belong. It's really great. I encourage it. <laughs> encourage it very much. And as you as you do this more and more, it will shift the church. If the church has been a veneer-focused church, o- over time it will become substance-focused because um, you're not rewarding veneer and you're being the genuine. And, 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 and then the people around you who are veneers, guess what? Sometimes they come around and they change too because sometimes they see the substance in you and it changes everything for them because they didn't know that that was a thing. They didn't realize that that was possible. So here are some lessons uh, for leaders. Some pastors get hired, like I said, because they have the appearance of religiosity. Um, Their veneer is always intact. They're very good on stage. They're very good in public meetings. They handle crowds well. They're not actually good as far as their character qualifications. And character matters a thousand times more than any of those other things. Um, If you're in a church where this is happening... My encouragement is that you may have never felt healthy leadership in your life. You may have never been around like just real authentic men and women of God who are just genuine and and transparent. And that is so healthy that I would encourage you, whether you leave your church or not, to at least get into your life some godly, genuine people. Humble people who don't have a veneer who you just, you, you just, you start doing life with or you just start getting together with them. You start being around them. You, you join and you, you're going to serve with them in whatever ministry they're doing because you don't want to burden them, but you just want to be around the genuine because it's going to show you how to live that as well. We really need that. We really need that. Now, I want you to imagine for a second, zoom back to the first century, pretend you're a first century Jew and imagine the impact of Jesus making these statements about the Pharisees, how that would affect your original audience, your eyes and ears. Because in your view, first century Jew, you think the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the, the um, maybe not as much the Sadducees, <laughs> but the Pharisees and the scribes for sure, these are the spiritual superheroes, right? The, scri- the Sadducees were, uh, the, sorry, the Sanhedrin are the ones that, um, and the Sadducees are not quite as loved. But definitely the Pharisees and the scribes, superhero, spiritual superheroes. These are like the godliest people. They're like your pinnacle example. And then Jesus just rips them a new one. And he says, see those people that you respect, that you love, that you look up to, they are a problem. And they're going to cause you problems because they're fake spirituality and their money grubbing mentality. In fact, they're going to be judged worse. You're thinking they're going to get a great judgment day. Man, I'd love to stand before God in their shoes. No, you wouldn't. It'll be even worse for them. So this just like the wool gets pulled out from over their eyes and they're just, wait a minute, they're fake, they're empty, and they're actually a danger to me and to themselves. That is what I see when I see shallow, fake spiritual leaders. I don't just see like a a, a little issue. It's an actual danger to, this, to self and to others. And, and Jesus warned us, but we keep falling for it. Over and over and over again, we keep falling for it. The people who endorse this fakery because they just don't know any better, it's just sad. It's sad. And Jesus warned us, God, though, he always sees the inside. He's constantly looking at what's internal to us. And I don't want to assume, here's a a big word of caution. The primary application is going to be for this, to apply this study to yourself. Make sure you don't have a veneer. What I don't want to do is create in us the mentality that we think, and you might even think I think this about myself, I I don't, that we can sort of glance at any pastor. Like I could watch a video of a pastor teaching and I'm like, "Mm, he's 83% veneer, I can tell, only 17% genuine, you know. I can't really do that. I usually have to pay attention to someone for a long time, many hours before I start to get a a taste of what's really going on there. Um, 
and even then it's it's very tentative often and it's very slow to develop um even the stuff with with brian simmons and the passion translation i've listened to read and listened to countless hours of his content to try to get a real bead on it so i can make a decision about these things and um and they're, they're very problematic of course but just be humble about it okay the main tool here is that you get planks out of your eye that's the main issue um then there's a beautiful moment. Okay, the next section that we're going to look at, and um, I promise I won't take forever. We're like going super long today. I knew it was going to be a long study. I should have warned all the, all the, uh, all the mods. No warning, just a long study. Here we go. Verse 41, and he sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury and many rich people were putting in large sums. I promise to move through this section faster, so stick with me. This is where it gets good. Well, it's already been good. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. And here we get the balance, the full balance, because I would, I mean, I'm telling you honestly, I would misteach this passage. I was going to if I hadn't read the next section and got the other side of the story. Um, very genuinely, I would have taught it wrong. Maybe because my own irritation, I do get personally irritated at money grubbing <laughs> preachers who devour widows' houses, but I can overreact to that as well. So he sits on opposite the treasury. The first thing you want to see is when this widow gives, it says that she gave like two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. This is what she gave. She gave, um, here's a picture of basically a reproduction of, of the widow's might. Um, th these two small copper coins, they're smaller than a penny each of them, they're worth almost nothing. The actual value of these coins in the first century, um, they're called lepta, These or lepton, is an individual one's lepton, so these are two lepta. And the these lepta were the smallest coin in circulation in Palestine. It was worth 1 64th of a denarius. Now I know you're like, 1 64th of a denarius, that doesn't help me at all. Okay, but bear with me. A denarius was, was how much you got paid for about one day of labor. So, you know, in our times, we think of a day of labor as eight hours of work. So if in eight hours of work, you got one denarius, what she gave was a total of 1 64th of that amount. In other words, she gave about seven and a half minutes worth of labor, worth of labor when she tossed that money into these like trumpet shaped uh, donation boxes that they had there at the temple in the court of women. So she gives that money about... Seven and a half minutes worth of work. Not much. Not much. Now, here's something interesting. What Mark does is, um, I'll share with you a tiny bit of Greeky things here, um, just because I think it's relevant. The widow, she came and gave two small copper coins. That's the lepta. Um, he says, which amount to a cent. So he, he, he translates for his readers. He tells them, what that what those coins were now but if they're using those coins in the first century why does he have to tell them it it amounts to a cent or a quadrant which is another another coin a different coin but the reason is that while these lepta are being used in ancient israel they're not being used in the other parts of the roman empire they're not being used in fact near rome where mark is probably writing his book his gospel he's not being used in that area why is that interesting because it shows two things that mark um, had correct and accurate information about, you know, ancient Israel that was not common knowledge to his readers. And it also shows that he is writing to these other readers. And, it, and when you separate Mark from ancient Israel, it makes all the details he gets about the geography and the fishing and the localities and the types of fish that are in the Sea of Galilee and the types of coins they are giving and they use and the debates between the Jews that only happened at that season that only happened in Israel at that season, it shows you that he's writing real history. This is another moment of real history in the Gospel of Mark, and we just would pass, pass it right up, not think about it, because we're looking for devotional application usually. Uh, pretty powerful, pretty interesting stuff. Now, don't you think the widow would have thought less of herself? She probably would have thought pretty poorly of her little offering, two little cents. She probably walked away thinking that she had given almost nothing, probably feeling ashamed. I imagine she did. I mean, I probably would, naturally speaking, if that was me. And 
other people around her probably thought she gave very little as well. And, and you're probably the same way. When you give very little to God, when you have hardly anything to give, and you give that little bit to him, you feel like it's nothing. Maybe you're you're laid up and you're sick. And you're very ill. And so you can only work for a very brief period of time each day. But during that time, you, you make sure to like get in the word or you go out and you witness or you, you share online or something. You're doing something for the Lord in that little brief period. But you feel lousy because you can only offer so little to God. And... You're, you may be the same as the widow thinking, because I gave so little, it's not worth much. And Jesus completely flips that. In verse 43, he says, calling his disciples, calling his disciples to himself, he said, to him, he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. Not more than any, but more than all. I mean, it sounds like he's saying she's given more than all of them combined. I mean, her, her offerings worth like nothing. Like the temple can't buy anything with what she gave. Like they can't buy anything. I don't know what they could possibly buy. Like, you know, buy one piece of wheat. <laughs> like, what are you going to buy with this thing? Yet it's more valuable than every other contribution that was given. This just blows my mind. They all, and the reason is given. They put it out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty. The fact that she's poor and still gave made her wor her value, uh, the worth of what she gave, more important. Um this might change how you view rich philanthropists. And I've been on a, a, a rant against them recently because, just because in the gospel market so happens to be coming up. We live in a time where giving and philanthropy is rewarded um, more highly than ever before because we have social media and you can actually, you can actually, for instance, with the fastest growing YouTube channel, uh, it, to my knowledge right now, is Mr. Beast. Their YouTube channel is growing so fast because he gives away large amounts of money in his videos. Primarily, that's what he does. Now, I mean, there's an element of this probably where he likes helping people, but primarily, it seems to me as though Mr. B, and I'm not trying to criticize him, okay? It's not like he's doing something bad by giving money away. These rich people aren't doing anything bad. It's just not as valuable as what the poor person gave. And so let me, bear with me a minute. I'm not trying to demonize anybody here. What I'm suggesting is this. If the if the reason why I'm giving is a growth strategy for online uh, YouTube, you know, kingdoms, <laughs> then you already got your reward. That's all I'm saying. It's nice that you gave. You definitely helped those people. You did, you've done great things. But those great things don't have nearly as much value as the person who gave privately, quietly, just to serve the Lord, just to honor God. And so the, the pri our private giving is of more value than our public giving. And more importantly here, our, our painful giving is more valuable than our painless giving. The giving that costs us has more value than the amount of our giving. You catch that the cost of my giving matters more than the amount I give. That's what I'm getting out of this. So when a, a philanthropist goes on Twitter and he's like, I'm going to give you know, such and such amount of money to someone who retweets this post. And everybody's retweeting their post because they all want money. And I just, as a Christian, I just think like, this whole thing seems really weird and sketchy to me, you know? <laughs> and then people are like, oh, they're a philanthropist. They just give money away. And they have this great reputation. It's like, I'm just like, great, but you already got your reward. Like that has no value in the kingdom of God. It's just... A, a a reputation strategy. It's it's a veneer. It's a veneer for attention. I don't I don't have I don't see value in it. Sorry. I see value in the impact it has in people's lives. I just don't see value as it relates to the person who's doing it for ulterior motives. So if it's done for press, it doesn't have value for the kingdom of God in that sense. Um, social media's growth strategies are oftentimes we just have non-religious scribes, right? Right? They're just not doing it in the name of God or in the name of religion. They're just doing it in the name of themselves. That's the only difference. I don't think that makes it better. So she puts in more than all of them. I'm going to say this, that this wasn't just cute. Oh, the cute old lady put, it was amazing. Her offering impressed Jesus. He wanted us to point her out. What she gave was more valuable than all those other people put together. What she gave was amazing. You know what this means? This means that churches that put, I'm sorry, churches. I'm just calling them like I see them here. We can, we can, we can grow from each other, and I hope you can, you can grow. Churches that put the names of wealthy givers on pews in their church are doing it wrong. First, I think most of us can agree it's weird to put the names of wealthy givers in the church, so everyone can know the name of the person who gave a lot of money. That's weird. But if you were to do it right. You'd be putting the name of poor givers on those pews, right? Because they gave the most. Because what they gave cost them the most. This pew is in honor of Auntie, Auntie Fran, who gave 75 cents, which was all she had to live on. 
it wouldn't be in honor of Bill Gates who gave ten million dollars and which didn't even impact him in any way, shape, or form. So the worth of our giving is not as valuable as the cost of our giving. How much it costs me to give, um, how much it's I sacrificed when I gave, that has more value. I don't want to overreact and think that that means no one can know when I give. Like if this is kind of a Calvary Chapel thing, at least at least in my circles, where if you're fasting and somebody discovers you're fasting, you should just quit. <laughs> Like that was something that I got years ago when I first started coming. And I was like, oh, okay, you know. And so I'd be fasting. And if someone like offered you food, you had a choice to either like say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm fasting. But then you revealed. So now it's not in secret. So now you lose your reward or something. Um, that's an overreaction. That's an overreaction. The heart of it is that we just don't want to be doing it for people to see. That's the main thing. I'm not doing it for people's vision. If someone finds out I did something nice, it doesn't mean I lost my reward. Um, the, the widow gave in public. The widow herself gives in public. Jesus sees her give in public. So that, and he doesn't rebuke her for that. So people knowing you're giving isn't the problem. It's it's the focus on people knowing that's the problem. Now I want to talk finally about the contrast. Um, last thing here, there's this major contrast between what Jesus, well, what I see here, Jesus rips on these guys for devouring widows' houses. In particular, leave those widows alone, right? Leave those old ladies alone, man. Stop trying to get their money, you money grubbing preacher scum. Like, I'm sorry. I get riled up and it drives me nuts when I see this stuff happening. So my reaction to this would be like, how about widows just don't give? Like if you're a widow in the church, you just don't give at all. Like we just take care of you. We, we, we have a, a fund in our fellowship that just helps make sure the widows that are really part of our church, not just people that come to church with handouts. I don't know if you know this, but just about every church has random strangers come every week asking for money. I'm a Christian. Can I have money? Like, this just happens in churches all the time. It, and um, if we don't know you, we're not just going to give you, hand you money. You, you seem to think we have a lot more money than we actually got. Um, but I, but that would be how I'd react. I'd be like, let's just, the widows don't give it all. But what Jesus says next totally ruins that for me. Because he commends the widow because she gives in. Let me find the passage here. He gives in all she owned, all she had to live on. Well, that kind of ruins that application, doesn't it? So there's a contrast here. The contrast is the money grubbing preachers targeting the the um, the vulnerable to get their money so they can enrich themselves. That's wicked. God will judge you for that. But when you have people who want to sacrificially give, even if they're poor, that's a wonderful thing. It just can't be compelled by the leaders. It must be the work of the spirit in the person's life. It must be a voluntary thing. As First Corinthians says, we don't give by compulsion, but willingly. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. You don't, everybody doesn't have to give all they have, um, you know, to ministry or to a church or to a missions organization or to like a Bible translation group or whatever. Everybody doesn't have to do that. But if you do that, it's wonderful. And it's not something we should be um, against or opposed to. It just has to come from a genuine love for God and for genuine service to God and not these scum people getting in the middle of it taking advantage of the generosity and the kingdom mindedness of these wonderful people in order to enrich themselves. That's, that's the thing. So the rules on giving, let me just go over them real quick. Second Corinthians, this is how, you know, if the church is doing it right. Second Corinthians nine, six, and seven. Now I say he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. By the way, this is not meaning that if you donate a hundred dollars, you'll get a thousand dollars. The, the the bounty is, the I think, the final, when we stand before God and we enjoy uh, the treasures of heaven. Okay, this is the context, the prosperity preachers, some of them, some of them would take this out of context. Verse 7 says, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, meaning it's entirely self-driven. It's not external. That's right. So if, if you're at a church and they're past the plate and they ask you, give more, and they pass the plate again. And then they say, give more, and they pass the plate again. That's in violation of uh, 2 Corinthians 9. Uh, you may be used to it. Maybe you've seen it a lot. Everybody else thinks you're weird. And they're right. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> um, each one must do justice. He's purposed in his own heart, not grudgingly. Now that's me. I'm the giver. I don't want to give grudgingly. I want to I want to say, Lord, this is a joy to give. I think that that widow probably enjoyed that she was able to do that, offer that sacrifice to the Lord. Um, so not, not grudgingly, that's the internal issue. And not under compulsion, that's an external issue. I can't have a leader pushing me to give, pushing me to give. You need to give, you need to give, you need to give. And uh, no, uh, that's wrong. The giving's got to be voluntary. It's got to be love-based. Love-based. And so 
when you're, you know, when you have little kids, you're like trying to train them to like be grateful to family members, you know? So you're like, go hug your uncle, go hug your grandpa, go hug your grandma, say thank you. And you like train them to, but God doesn't want us to be little children like that. Spiritually speaking, he wants us to be grown up and grown up followers of Jesus do not have to be told you have to give, you have to give this percentage. You have to give this much. This is not a mature Christian walk. The grown up Christian is saying, right, which we're all called to be. I want to give because I want to give, Lord, because I want to honor you, because I want to further your kingdom, because I want to see, um, I believe in this ministry and the reach it's having, because I, I want to support those who are ministering to me. Um, these are these are the things. That it's, it's motivated out of love. It's motivated out of trust in God and his ability to provide. God loves a cheerful giver, a cheerful giver. So there you go. There's a few of the rules. Um, so hopefully this helps to eradicate in somebody who watches it, the, 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 the veneer of Christianity, right? There are missionaries who are out there who they do an outreach so they can get pictures, so they can put it in a newsletter. They do not do it so they can do an outreach. They do it so they can get pictures, so they can put it in a newsletter, so they can get income from their donors. They didn't start missions like that, but somehow it turned into that. There are pastors who get, who get hands raised, who are compelling people to raise their hands and everyone's praying, Lord, bring people to Christ. And they're trying to get hands raised so they can write down those numbers and report them back to a denominational headquarters so that they can get credit in their church for how many people got saved or how many baptisms they had. They should still be asking people to come to Christ, but the motive is wrong. And that's when the veneer has taken over. There are Christians who offer to pray for other people and their goal in offering to pray for you is to like take spiritual leadership to compete with you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm the one who prays for you. So I'm spiritually above you. And this is the dynamic that's going on in their heart instead of just like Christian brotherly love and caring for one another. Um, and so we should offer to pray. We should be praying for one another, but not to achieve spiritual rank above or below other people. That's ungodly. And it so easily seeps into us because we are humans who have all the same temptations as the scribes, all the same ones. Jesus is forever focused on our internal issues. It's like he's sitting right now watching our giving, watching our worship, watching our, our things. And he sees it not the way the world does. Oh, that person gave a lot. That widow gave a little. He sees it the way it really is. That person loves me. That person's fake. He knows exactly what's really going on. So we should live like he does. We should live like he does. And my, my last encouragement is this. And then I'll pray for my extra long, extra long Bible study today. Um, final encouragement. You may have service to the Lord that's costly to you. That seems like it's nothing. It seems like you're giving God nothing. It is hard for you to do it. You read the Bible, you're dyslexic. So you read the Bible and you're like, I can read for 30 minutes and I get five verses. I think that that Bible reading was more valuable than my Bible reading when it comes easy. You have service to God that, that you know, you, you, you share the gospel with a family member and it was the scariest thing you've ever done. It was the hardest thing you've ever done. You didn't even enjoy it. <laughs> I think that that sacrifice to God, if we're going to measure things by sacrifice, it has even more value than the person who does it so easily and so simply. The things that we do for the Lord that cost us, we tend to think those things have less value, but I'm saying that perhaps because of Jesus here, we should think those things are um, even more valuable. This doesn't mean that if you're rich and you give and it's easy, that that has no value. It just... It just doesn't have the same value as sacrificial giving. That's all. The sacrificial giving is the stuff that is just off the charts valuable to the Lord. Boy, that cost me. Because love is sacrifice. Love is sacrifice. When I watch some cheesy girl movie with my wife, um, she knows that's an act of love. Whereas if I watch Lord of the Rings, she knows I like Lord of the Rings. I want to watch Lord of the Rings. You see how these are different? They're both good things, right? watching a show, sitting with my wife, taking some time to relax. They're both good things. But when I do the thing that I, that she knows is harder for me to do, or I don't want to do, but I do it for her. That is a greater sacrifice and act of love. And so when you're worshiping and you're having a hard, the hardest time in the world worshiping, but you're just going to command your soul to praise God because he's worthy and he deserves it. I feel that that worship has a special value in the eyes of God. Oftentimes when you're thinking your service to God is at its lowest value, I think that Jesus sees it at its highest value. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you give us eyes to see ourselves um, the way that you see us, Jesus, that we could see reflected back to us in your word, the, a clear examination of our hearts. So there's no veneer. There's just the real us really loving and serving you, dealing with the temptations. Help us, Lord, as leaders. Help us as servants to not be focused on the reputation, but focus on substance. 
to not worry about what people think of us, but worry about serving you and what you think of us. And we pray, Lord, that we be encouraged in our sacrificial giving, that it's good and it's beautiful, but that those of us who have influence in others would be discouraged from manipulating others to our own ends, our own benefit in any way, shape, or form. We pray, Father, for the humility to do the right thing in all those things. And we pray, Lord, that you just give us focus upon your kingdom and upon the gospel and upon the truth of Christ right now. We live in a, a, a tough time. It's, it's always been a tough time, I guess, but it feels like it's extra tough today. We pray that you give us hearts that are aware of your kingdom, your desires, your goals, and we wouldn't get wrapped up too much in the things that are going on, but that if there's things you'd have us to do about current events, that you'd, you'd help us to have the courage to step forward and do it. We just ask for that wisdom and discernment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Was that long enough? Was that a good prayer? I hope, I hope that was a good prayer. I hope you guys think I'm spiritual. <laughs> All right. Hey, I'll, hey, Wednesday, I've got a video coming out with Dr. Craig Blomberg. This is the last video for a, for quite a while on the Passion Translation. We're going to be a long pause and I'll do a few more in the same vein as this one. Um, that's coming out on Wednesday. We're going to talk about 1 Corinthians. It's a long video and I think it's a very informative thing. You're going to see even some new some footage that's in there that you don't see in other places from Brian Simmons as well. And then Friday, we got the Q&A and that's about all. Um, yeah. Lord bless you guys. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Remember what all, all these kingdoms are fighting for your commitment right now. Remember your first primary commitment is the kingdom of Christ.